As I mentioned at the outset, uh, the original genesis of this uh, conference was to focus on the international uh, status of the climate change talks, and we spent the morning already doing that. But now we want to shift to the closely and intimately related issue of U.S. climate change legislation. Uh, subsequent to our uh, setting up this event, the Kerry Lieberman uh, bill, the American Power Act, uh, was tabled just a week ago yesterday, and uh, our team, led by Trevor Hauser, has done uh, not only yeoman but almost uh, unbelievable work in quantifying within literally a week the impact that that bill might have on all the key economic and environmental variables uh, that it addresses. Um, I introduced Trevor earlier, so I don't have to do it again. Uh, I will simply ask him to retake the uh, podium, uh, lay out for us the legislation and what it would mean. Uh, he and the members of his research team will then take the podium or take the, uh, the table for some Q&A afterward. Um, you do have in your packets the policy brief that Trevor and his colleagues produced to lay out the analysis. It includes a very detailed table that gives you in quite some uh, specificity, the results across different time periods of all these different variables um, that's summarized in the press release that you have as well. So I want to thank Trevor and his colleagues for having done uh, really a unique and uh, uh, unbelievably uh, uh, rapid piece of analysis uh, on a very important piece of legislation. And I want to thank him and them for sharing it with us today. Trevor. Thanks very much, Fred. Uh, we uh, uh, we started actually uh, preparing this analysis in February uh, in anticipation of a bill being released, and uh, and every time we got a kind of news release or you know gossip about what was going to be in the bill or not the bill, we'd kind of test out a couple runs of our model and see what it came up with, and had all of our kind of charts and tables ready so that you know the uh, the, the the minute the bill came out, we could we could dig through it and and uh, make the necessary changes to the modeling framework and try to produce a report uh, quickly. Um, the consequence of that is that neither myself or my two co-authors who've joined me here today have slept much in the past uh, week, and so I'll try to kind of put together uh, cogent sentences and any uh, you know millions instead of thousands or gigawatts instead of kilowatts labeling errors you find in the charts, and a couple folks have been good enough to bring that up can be attributed to that uh, same uh, sleep deficit. Uh, fortunately, I had a... Uh, 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 my wife had her, our first child a couple months ago, so I don't sleep anyway, and so I, I can work on this at like 2 a.m. Uh, with a uh, w w while the baby uh, uh, is with me. Um, so what we did is uh, we used the Department of Energy's uh, National Energy Modeling System to uh, analyze the major provisions in the bill. NEMS is the model that the Department of Energy's uh, Energy Information Administration uses uh, for its annual energy outlook and what it uses for, uh, for analysis of, uh, of energy and climate uh, legislation. Uh, we took uh, the assumptions in terms of technology cost, rates of deployment, et cetera, uh, from NEMS, the, the kind of standard assumptions with two exceptions. Uh, the first, we are running, we ran the analysis using uh, the 2009 uh, version of the model. Uh, last week, EIA came out with the 2010 uh, report. We didn't have time to switch over and use the 2010 model since all that prep work we've been doing since February was on the 2009 version. Uh, but what we did do is bring over the capital cost estimates for uh, for uh, uh, for power that were in the 2010 because there were some significant revisions uh, that we thought were uh, were important, uh, particularly nuclear power. Uh, they've increased the capital cost estimates by 16 percent between 2009 and 2010, and so we want to make sure that we capture that. The other change that we made is, is in the way that uh, the model calculates employment, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail later. Uh, we felt that, 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 that looking out over the kind of landscape of economic models used to assess uh, the impact of energy and climate legislation on employment, the, 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 the most significant kind of shortcoming uh, was the way that they uh, assess what the impact would be of increased investment in the power sector in the U.S. at a time when the U.S. economy is uh, below full employment like today. Uh, that they can give us a kind of good 50-year picture of what the impact will be, but they don't give us a good next decade picture. And since unemployment's at 10% and kind of 
efforts to, 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 to increase employment and drive investment is so important politically right now to folks on the Hill. Uh, we wanted to, to make an attempt at capturing that better. We also wanted to inject a little sanity into a green jobs debate that we think has become increasingly untethered from reality. You have uh, uh, assessments of the potential employment impacts of, of, uh, of, of pricing carbon uh, that use kind of these simple bottom-up approaches uh, where you just look at the number of jobs in clean tech that will be created, not subtracting the number of jobs that will be lost in decreased sales to fossil fuels or the jobs that are lost through higher energy prices. Uh, and so our approach tries to kind of bridge the divide between those two approaches to calculating employment. And I'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit. So what we... What we modeled, uh, this is the, the bill, the American Power Act, has uh, seven provisions in it, and we modeled uh, the major portions of four of them. Uh, so the first is uh, domestic clean energy development, which includes a kind of broad range of incentives for uh, clean energy technology, for nuclear power, for carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, for vehicles, for efficiency, and for renewable energy. There's also language in there on offshore drilling, and it's important to note that, that when we compared that language to what is in the reference case in 2009 from EIA, our estimation was that it doesn't impact, it doesn't change the business as usual trajectory, given EIA's assessments of when uh, offshore acreage comes open for exploration. I can talk about that more uh, in the Q&A in the if, if folks are interested in that piece. Uh, so we assume no change relative to BAU in, uh, in, in, in offshore oil development. Uh, then there's Title II, which is uh, the, the kind of core greenhouse gas pollution reduction program. It includes goals, economy-wide targets, of 17% emission reductions below 2005 by 2020 and 83% uh, by 2050. Uh, and then it includes some sector-specific regulations uh, to, uh, to achieve that goal. So there's a, uh, a cap-and-trade program that, uh, uh, that, that, that covers roughly the same amount of the economy as the Waxman-Markey bill did, but there's, there's important, uh, a couple of important differences in how it functions. The first uh, is that industry isn't covered under the program until 2016. Uh, the program starts in 2013. Uh, the second is that the transport sector uh, does not participate in allowance trading. Uh, they purchase allowances at a fixed price each quarter. Uh, there's also a price collar uh, that's put in place. It's, the ceiling starts at $25 uh, in 2009 and escalates at 5% a year on top of inflation. The floor starts at $12 a ton, escalating at 3% a year on top of inflation. Uh, then there's Title III is dubbed consumer protection. 65% uh, of the allowance value over the full 50 years of the program is, is, is described as being for consumer protection. Uh, in the early years, uh, that is through free allocation of emission allowances to local distribution companies, uh, whether electric power or natural gas, uh, with kind of instructions in the bill that that allocation should be used for ratepayer benefit. Uh, as time progresses, that share of allocation uh, to LDCs declines, and uh, and and and. Consumers are the, there's an attempt to keep consumers whole through rebating uh, the uh, revenue collected through allowance auctions directly to consumers uh, through a kind of check in the mail. Uh, the low income consumers get 15% of the allowance value throughout uh, the period. That doesn't change. And then there's Title IV, which is uh, dubbed job protection and growth. The kind of major portions of these provisions. Our, uh, our, our treatment for energy intensive manufacturing, uh, something that we've worked on a lot here in the past. Uh, they are broadly similar to what we saw in Waxman Markey, uh, with the exception of the, the, the start date uh, for border adjustments being pushed back uh, because the coverage for industrial sectors uh, under the program starts later uh, than it did in Waxman. Uh, then there's also some, some provisions uh, related to transport here that were not in the Waxman Markey bill. Uh, there are strong incentives for uh, heavy vehicles to switch to natural gas, uh, and there is uh, uh, EPA guidance. There's a significant amount of preemption uh, of EPA and of, of state authority uh, in the legislation, and uh, there's guidance given to EPA on how to set future CAFE uh, improvements. Uh, that guidance is qualitative, not quantitative. Uh, we provide the language in the bill, and so to deal with that, you know, in EIA's business as usual scenario, CAFE standards increased to 2016, uh, given current regulations, and then they plateau. Uh, we did an alternative scenario where we extend that rate of improvement 
Uh, and so on the relevant sections of this analysis, I'll show you how the kind of core scenario that assumes CAFE standards don't increase anymore after 2016, and the CAFE scenario where it assumes that they continue to increase at that rate, how that differs in terms of the impact. Uh, titles five through seven are not particularly germane to the uh, to the economics uh, of the bill, and so uh, so we didn't uh, we didn't model them. Happy to come back with questions on kind of any of this uh, in, in in the Q and A, what's actually in the bill and how we modeled. But some of the core results are uh, the you know the, the general trend of the legislation as you see uh, the results. Again, we only modeled a 2030 because that's where the 2009 version of, uh, of EIA's model runs through. Uh, you see a decline in fossil fuels. Uh, this is measured in quadrillion BTU uh, as a share of total uh, primary energy consumption to, uh, to 2030 uh, and an increase in nuclear power, which is, uh, these don't have labels on them, do they? Uh, brown is uh, fossil fuels, uh, blue is nuclear power, and green is renewables. Uh, so you see a, 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 a increase in renewables and fossil fu and, uh, and, and nuclear power. So we go from 84% fossil fuels today to 70% fossil fuels in 2030, and from 8% each for nuclear and renewables today uh, to 14% uh, and 16% respectively uh, in uh, in 2030. Uh, so 30% for non-fossil fuel energy. The most significant changes are in the power sector. Uh, this is new gross construction of new power generation capacity uh, between 2010 and 2030. Uh, this, is, this is gross. It doesn't include retirements. There's significant retirements, uh, particularly in coal-fired power generation uh, as, uh, as a result of the legislation. Uh, and so we see you know, the most additions in, in renewables, although not as much over business as usual. Uh, most of the renewable capacity additions to 2020 happen as a result of the stimulus provisions in the model, and so they are uh, uh, they're, 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 they're not much higher in the, in the policy scenario. Uh, you get an extra kind of 24, 25 gigawatts uh, of renewable deployment, uh, mostly in wind, uh, as a result of the bill. Nuclear sees the uh, biggest additions relative to business as usual. Uh, a gross addition of, of about 78 gigawatts, uh, given the assumptions in, uh, in, in EIA's modeling. Uh, and then 72 gigawatts of, uh, of carbon capture and sequestration, uh, uh, the majority of which is on coal, but some of which is on, on natural gas on, and no additional uh, oil-fired uh, power generation capacity. In terms of output, even though renewables post larger gains in terms of capacity, uh, the amount of electricity you get from every gigawatt of renewables is less than what you get from every gigawatt of nuclear, and so nuclear accounts for 29% uh, of total electricity generation in 2030, uh, a little higher than coal without CCS uh, that year, but still lower than coal uh, with carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, in terms of the energy market impacts, uh, this is, so what we get out of NEMS is a, uh, an assessment of U.S. oil imports uh, and global oil production by uh, region or in a couple places country like Brazil, Canada, Russia uh, are broken out separately. Uh, we did, so the OPEC and the non-OPEC in those countries specifically, that, those are the actual modeled results uh, for kind of indicative purposes. Uh, for the other countries, we, we, we estimated what would happen if their share of U.S. imports from that region that we see today was held constant. Of course, there's tremendous uncertainty about that kind of within the OPEC Middle East basket. What's the share of Saudi versus Iraq versus Iran? Uh, but just as a kind of thought experiment, that's the methodology uh, that we used. And we see a decrease in the core scenario. So this assumes CAFE standards plateau in 2016. Uh, we see a decrease of about 771 thousand barrels a day uh, against business as usual, uh, or 9 percent, uh, and a 33 percent reduction against current levels uh, in the, a decrease in U.S. expenditure on imported oil of uh, 51 billion a year in 2030. Uh, the decrease, because the U.S. is such a large part of the global oil market, the decrease in U.S. demand decreases global oil prices, all other things being equal, even once you account for the kind of rebound in demand in other parts of the world because prices are lower. And so oil producer revenues uh, in the model are lower by about $263 billion a year. Excuse me, in 2030. In the CAFE scenario, so again, this is assuming that the 2011 to 2016 CAFE improvements continue. Uh, we see about double the level of, of, of reduction in oil net imports uh, off of BAU, 
uh, and uh, 93 billion dollars less on oil expenditures from the U.S. and 436 billion less on oil, expend on oil producer revenues as a result of that scenario. On the environmental side, we uh, we model the there's there's a couple assumptions you have to make when uh, when when running a model that runs through 2030 instead of through 2050 because the program runs to 2050. The bill allows for banking and borrowing, so I can reduce emissions more in the early years and save those credits for compliance in later years. That's called banking. Uh, in the Waxman-Markey bill, there was, uh, the, when EIA modeled it, they assumed that there was 13 gigatons in the bank balance uh, in 2030, which meant that the level of emissions reductions from the bill in 2030 were much greater than what the defined cap uh, would suggest for that year. Uh, the Kerry Lieberman uh, draft has a price collar in it uh, that in our analysis binds starting in 2031, 2032. Uh, we hit that ceiling. And, uh, and given the capital cost estimates that, are, that, that the EIA uses and, and, and considerations that I can talk about if people are interested, we assume that there is no banking uh, uh, beyond 2031 because you're at the ceiling and uh, in that thus the kind of 2030 bank balance is 2 billion tons. Uh, the reason I say all that as a kind of net impact is that you have less abatement uh, in, in the Kerry Lieberman Act in 2030, even though the defined cap is the same uh, than is modeled in the, in the Waxman Market Bill. Now, of course, these are estimates about what the market will do in terms of banking and borrowing and, 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 and are fairly subjective. So the kind of objective reality of the differences between the two could be less great. Uh, but what that gets us is in overall U.S. emissions, uh, a 17% reduction uh, by, uh, by 2020 and a 32% reduction by 2030 if you include international offsets. There's less international offsets allowed in the Kerry Lieberman bill than there was in Waxman Markey. From covered sectors, the decline is even greater. The covered sectors meet their goal of a 42% reduction below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, I should say this, is, this model's not great at assessing the impact of the bill on non-covered sectors. There are complementary provisions. There's a separate trading program for HFCs. Uh, we don't assess that in this program. Uh, it is possible that, uh, uh, that the, uh, the non-covered sectors will, will see not a commensurate but a, but, but a larger decline than, than, than we show here. And the other point that's important to note is that uh, EIA came out with a report a few weeks ago showing that 2009 emissions in the U.S. were 9 percent below where they were in 2008. That's not captured here, uh, which could make the kind of emission reductions. It doesn't make the total emission reductions lower in 2020 than we show here, unless that decline happened a lot in uncovered sectors and they don't re rebound. But it makes the cost of getting to your 2020 target uh, lower. Okay, so now on to the uh, to the job story, and I used a probably somewhat confusing waterfall chart here to try to explain the different components of what's happening in the labor market as a result of energy and climate policy. So, on the upside, creating a price for carbon uh, creates across a 30-year period uh, an additional 18. Uh, $22.5 billion in annual investment in the power sector um, because the majority of our generation assets are over 20 years old. And so the decision is between continuing and, and, and uh, um, maintaining existing assets or replacing them with new assets. So that net additional investment uh, in low carbon energy uh, delivers just north of 300,000 jobs in the, first, in the first decade. I'll talk about the second decade in a second. Uh, that's the direct and the indirect and the induced jobs. So what that means is jobs actually installing the plant, jobs in the supply chain, and jobs created when those workers go and spend money. Uh, this is the assessment just going from nuclear to biofuels and stopping. That's the methodology that folks used uh, in a lot of reports assessing the stimulus program, where they said, look, if we take $100 billion from the future, borrow money, and we dump it into clean energy, how many jobs could we get? Uh, that works okay from this for a stimulus setting where you're thinking about you know, you need to do Keynesian ditch digging, and so it's better to kind of put the money into a wind farm than to put it into a ditch. Uh, it doesn't apply when you're talking about climate policy because that increase in investment is coming with a commensurate decrease in production of fossil fuels, and there's higher energy prices to pay for that investment, and it has an employment impact. So we capture those things as well here. Uh, so the fossil fuel reduction in employment, and again, this is direct, indirect, and induced, is that 72,000 job number there. Uh, and then the energy price impact 
uh, takes you down into the net negative job territory. Uh, but that increase in energy prices that consumers see, only a margin of that is for actual increase in cost of supplying energy. Uh, the rest is a transfer in revenue to the government in the form of an allowance price or to companies if the allowances are, are freely allocated. So we map out what the employment benefits are of using that allowance revenue, given what's in the bill. Uh, so the biggest chunk is the consumer refund, both low income and non-low income. Uh, then spending on energy efficiency. There's a large transportation set aside, both for the highway trust fund and for other things, uh, and, uh, and clean energy R&D, and a little bit for adaptation. Uh, using the macroeconomic model that, that NEMS provides, we're then able to test what are the macroeconomic impacts of that increase in investment, right? So higher interest rates, because you have that money has to come from somewhere, and it's either gonna result in higher interest rates competition for investment from other sectors, or the capital is going to come from abroad, uh, and you're going to see higher exchange rates, or you're going, to, uh, you're going to increase household savings rates. And we're able to capture all of that, which is the kind of macro effects category, and that gives us a net of 203,000 jobs above business as usual in the first decade. Now, a lot of the reason that that's possible is because EIA shows us being at below full employment. Uh, until, 20, uh, until 2020. And so that additional investment is not as inflationary as it would be in other periods. And a lot of the energy price increases are offset through the free allocation of allowances to local distribution companies. If you look beyond 2020, 2020 to 2030, the investment continues to increase above business as usual, but as we go back to full employment, it becomes more inflationary. Energy prices get higher. Over the, and some of those jobs gains are clawed back. Over the full 20-year period that we modeled, uh, you're roughly in line with business as usual. You're at like plus 6,000 jobs uh, above business as usual, so pretty much just the rounding error in the model. Now, it's important to note there's a couple things that, that, that we don't capture in this model that could change the kind of long-term employment picture from energy and climate legislation. We don't capture any increase in U.S. export competitiveness as the result of, uh, of the bill, because that's pretty hard to quantify. Uh, we don't capture uh, uh, knowledge spillover to the extent that investment and innovation in the clean energy space improves the efficiency of production in other parts of the economy. I mean, over the long term, you can grow your economy by piling on factors, capital or labor, or through technological change. So the question is, is the rate of technological change spillover into other sectors greater for a dollar of investment in clean energy than a dollar investment in other spaces where it's coming from? And that's something that we, that we don't assess in the model. Uh, finally, we don't do a good job of assessing uh, uh, market failures. Uh, most of the modeling frameworks assume that capital is going naturally to its most efficient uses. We know from our work in energy efficiency, we did a report last year with uh, uh, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development looking pretty comprehensively at, at building efficiency and barriers to investment. And there are lots of opportunities for investment in efficiency that have a higher rate of return uh, than the economy-wide average. If policy is successful in unlocking those, uh, then, then, then overall output increases. And that's something that we all capture as well. So that could all change the kind of long-term employment, uh, the employment picture. But the short-term takeaway, given our model, is that uh, the bill has a mildly stimulative impact on the economy in the first decade, uh, and then you're back at business as usual uh, by 2030. On the consumer side, you see higher energy prices for households ranging from between 3% to 7%, uh, whether you're talking about gasoline or electricity, uh, on average between 2011 and 2030. Uh, there's a difference between our two scenarios and whether you, that means on average, you're spending more on energy than you would under business as usual in your household or whether you're spending less. Uh, in our core scenario, the average household is spending, what is it, 107, 135? Shocked you have a number. I should have that number on the top of my head. Uh, 100 something dollars a year more uh, than uh, business as usual. Uh, in the cafe scenario, because of the decrease in expenditures on gasoline, the average household is spending $35 a year less uh, per, than, than under business as usual. But it's important to note that cafe standards are not free, uh, they come with higher vehicle prices generally, uh, and, uh, and that, that can offset uh, uh, some of the. Uh, um, can offset some of the, uh, the, uh, the decrease. Uh, this is before you apply the money that's been rebated to households, to low-income consumers, <laughs> through allowances. In forthcoming analysis, we'll look at the distributional impact by income decile and see you know, whether the bottom tenth, the next tenth, and third tenth are held whole, or whether they uh, see a net decline uh, uh, in, uh, in consumption. 
Uh, we're also in kind of forthcoming analysis. We tried to get the core pieces out as quick as we could. Uh, we're going to disaggregate these results at the state level, uh, and we're going to uh, provide industry by industry impacts uh, using the methodology that we uh, uh, that we developed for the uh, for the job side here. Uh, we're also going to look at in, in a conversation about energy security, we can kind of throw up numbers about dollars less spent internationally. The real question is, how successful is the legislation in buffering us if there is an impact uh, uh, in global, global oil supply uh, if you have a price spike, uh, not if oil markets are kind of stable as in the business as usual protection. We're going to do some scenario, uh, scenario uh, work surrounding that. So that's the, that's the kind of breadth of what's in the, uh, what's in the study. Happy to answer questions about any of that. I'm going to ask my co-authors, uh, Shashank Mohan, who's our kind of modeling whiz, and, uh, and Ian Hoffman, who uh, uh, knows the ins and outs of these technologies, to join me on stage for all of the questions that I know nothing about. Well, thanks once again for doing this uh, and doing it so quickly. As you said, you had a little head start, but uh, I know you still had to do a lot of that uh, burning of midnight oil, literally. So uh, making the energy problem worse. Okay, floor is open. Again, uh, use the traveling mic or go to the standing mic, introduce yourself, and then fire away. First of all, congratulations. Uh, my name is Joe Dukert. I'm an independent energy analyst and a senior associate at CSIS. Uh, you mentioned incorporating a 16 or 17 percent increase in capital cost for nuclear power. I wonder if going forward uh, you might at least take a look at changing your base year from 2008 to 2009, specifically for two reasons. 2009 was obviously not a uh, a typical year, but a couple of important things happened. Uh, up until uh, recently, up until s uh, 2006, 2007, we were getting about 48.5% of our total electricity from coal. Last year, remarkably, that percentage dropped to 44.6%, very sharp uh, uh, decrease. I have my own theories about why that happened. The second thing concerns the price of natural gas. You used a price of $13 and something, uh, which I'm pretty sure is not going to be typical going forward, not only because of shale gas. There are other reasons why I think uh, the base price uh, you might want to look at for natural gas would be maybe half that. That's a, that's a, so that's a great point. We, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, skepticism in the industry community and in the modeling community about uh, the NEMS model's capability to capture what's happening in shale gas right now. Uh, if you look at the gas prices in their estimate for, uh, uh, for, for 2009, 2010, there are about what we're seeing at Henry Hub today, but they predict a recovery in gas prices uh, 2015 through 2030 that a lot of industry th folks don't think is going to eventuate. If you don't see a return to $10 gas and instead you see us kind of permanently a $5 gas, obviously that changes uh, the picture in significant ways. Uh, one other piece that we were not able to model uh, that could change the story is that the, the bill has provisions for uh, merchant coal uh, that, the, that the gas industry believes will will lead to uh, to fuel switching from, uh, from, from coal to gas in the merchant sector, the way that the uh, allocations are structured. And uh, we didn't model that, but there's some, some industry analysis that thinks you'd actually see a much stronger uptick in gas. You guys okay. have anything? Bernie? Oh, oh, sorry. Bernie? Uh, Ernie Prig, Manufacturers Alliance. Just a, a, a question on your table one on page four. Uh, on renewables, uh, with business as usual, American Power Act, for 2020, it goes up 1.4, 11.6 to 13. But then when you break it down, almost all renewables stay the same, and the entire increase comes from biomass, up from 3.0 to 4.4. Yeah. I wonder whether you might want to comment on that. Ian, do you want to talk about why we see such a strong increase in biomass in the model? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, there, there are three reasons. Mike. The three reasons. We, we see almost immediately a very strong increase in co-firing at, uh, at, 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 at current uh, coal plants. 
it's, uh, it's, it's uh, almost costless. It, it's about a uh, hundred to hundred and fifty dollars, depending on what percentage of, of the fuel you're of the coal you're replacing, to uh, to uh, implement co-firing, and so that's almost the very first thing that comes off. And uh, then uh, uh, you also have a, a very very the model just builds an awful lot of right at the end in the kind of the twenty twenty to twenty thirty range. It, uh, it starts really trimming coal back and replacing it with uh, BIGCC. It, uh, it's biomass uh, integrated gasification. And, um, and so we, uh, we see a substantial amount of that. Where we also see a, a substantial amount is on the end use side. Uh, in, uh, and it's modeled as a, as a reduction in, in industrial demand. You see a, a much well, at least an assumption of a much higher level of availability of biomass fuels for some energy intensive sectors such as pulp paper. Uh, and uh, so those are uh, those uh, reduce cost and cause a significant build in those end use industries. Okay. Yeah, John. Uh, John Williamson of the Institute. Um, uh, it, it's a c question about the consumer uh, protection aspect of um, your, your proposal, uh, sorry, the, the bill, um, where you say that in the uh, early years the consumer protection is in fact going to be given by giving free allowances to the electricity and local natural gas companies and that uh, uh, they will be instructed to pass that on to the consumers. Um, question, uh, do you in fact believe that uh, uh, that's going to happen <laughs> and uh, what uh, mechanism is involved to ensure that uh, it does happen? Yeah. Uh, I think we, like most folks, are uh, uh, suspicious about whether or not that will actually happen kind of as instructed uh, in, the, uh, in the bill. Uh, a lot of it will have to do with how the local regulatory entities treat uh, kind of implementation of the uh, of the legislation and, and the rulemaking process uh, surrounding it. There is oddly, and some we have we, uh, we have someone from CBO here who can actually maybe speak to this better than I can. But uh, for the drafters, you know, everybody wants to make sure that their uh, bill is is deficit neutral, right? Budget neutral, and uh, and if you tell if you if you if you mandate the use of those allowances for a specific purpose like energy efficiency in the households uh, then you have to take a haircut on the total allowances that you have available to kind of keep CBO scoring of the bill budget neutral and so the CBO rules end up driving a lot more of how these policies get designed than you would uh, uh, than you would imagine because you've you've got a scarce pot of allowances and uh, and so sometimes you see the authors going to kind of vague appeals rather than firm regulatory requirements to uh, keep their CBO scoring looking good. Okay, there was another hand. Okay. Nobody else. All right, Trevor and colleagues, anything else you want to add by way of elaboration? Okay, this is your last shot to figure out what all this means before you have to go vote on it. <laughs> All right, Trevor, again, many thanks to you and your colleagues. We're right on time. We'll segue into the final panel. Thank you much.